Hello, I'm Bimelzebub, and welcome to my channel. Before we get into today's video, let's have a quick disclaimer. While Laura is a great nurse, this video is not a replacement for actual medical care. If you have medical questions, please see your doctor. Speaking of seeing your doctor, ideally, how often should a woman see her OBGYN? Well, it kind of depends on whether you're sexually active and how old you are and what your risk factors are. If you're sexually active and you have multiple partners, you'll want to see your ob -GYN every three to six months, at least twice a year, just to get checked for everything, or at least see a clinic or something to get your urine checked or something for everything. And you'll want a pap smear every year if you're sexually active with multiple partners. If you're sexually active and monogamous, sometimes your ob -GYN will be comfortable with you seeing them every three years um, to get a pap smear and just to get everything checked out. They do a breast exam and a pelvic exam and check your cervix and make sure everything's looking good. They palpate your abdomen to see if they can feel any cysts or anything on your ovaries. It's a good idea to go um, at least every three years if you're either sexually inactive or monogamous, go at least every three years to get a pap smear. And every ob guy will have kind of a different recommended schedule. Just talk to yours and figure out the schedule and what they recommend. What about trans men? Should they continue to see an ob guy um, all the way up through and maybe even after uh, transition, if that's something they intend on doing? Yeah, trans gents should continue to see an ob -GYN, um, with a, kind of the same similar guidelines if they're sexually active more frequently. Um, unfortunately, trans gents can feel really dysphoric when they go and see an ob -GYN because, um, and like trigger warning, um, they do pelvic exams and they you know, use a speculum and it's very invasive. And if you're not comfortable with that part of your body anyway, having it closely examined by a doctor who is often a man, <laughs> sometimes they're women, it's, there's a whole lot of different ob -GYNs, but it can be really dysphoria inducing for a lot of people. Uh, it's, everybody's different. They're gonna have different levels of dysphoria and everybody's support system is different. If you've got a good support system who can go with you, and hold your hand and walk, talk you through it, great. If that makes it worse, don't do that. Try to find something that helps you, but it is still important for transgents to go see an ob guy because they're still at risk for cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. Um, even if you do fully transition, you're still at risk for some of those things. Um, so it's still a good idea to go, even though it's hard. All right, yeah, it, it kind of seems like um, it's gonna suck, but it I, I don't know, maybe just uh, deal with it for the sake of your health, I guess. I mean, there's... Yeah, and it's easy for us to say because we're not dysphoric, but it is important. Uh, and trans women should start seeing an ob -GYN too as part of their transition. Um, they'll be seeing their endocrinologist and their psychiatrist and stuff, but they should also start to see an ob -GYN. So how frequently should a woman do a self-check for breast cancer? Uh, it's a good idea to just do one whenever you think of it, uh, but at least like once a month because some really aggressive tumors can grow that quickly. Um, it's a good idea to do a breast check and gents can do this too because gents are not immune to breast cancer. Um, but doing uh, in the shower where you're warm and relaxed and alone and naked and just kind of palpate or, you know, feel touch around the outside of your breast and move your way kind of inward. Um, it's not the most smooth tissue anyway. It's kind of a lumpy, bumpy part of the body anyway. But if you notice anything different or changing or uncomfortable, that would be something to draw uh, your doctor's attention to. All right. Are there any uh, health risks in particular that women should be on the lookout for? Well, I mean, a lot of general sexual and pelvic health risks apply to all genders, but some that women are particularly prone to or that are associated with women more frequently or with vulvas and vaginas more frequently are like urinary tract infections, yeast infections, bacterial vaginosis, uh, dermatitis, things like that. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the HPV vaccine. What can you tell us about that? Uh, 
First, I'm extremely pro-vaccine, so please get it. <laughs> uh, some people are aged out. I think you and I are aged out of the optimal time to get that. I think that they're starting to do it at age 9 to 11 for boys and girls. Um, HPV, human papillomavirus, is a sexually transmitted disease that can cause uh, genital warts and cancers, multiple kinds of cancers, most commonly cervical cancer. Um, there are multiple different strains of it. The vaccine covers a few, the most um, cancer-causing ones. Um, and that's kind of what you go in to get pap smears for, is to check for abnormal cell growth on your cervix to see if you're um, developing warts or cancer. Um, and HPV is a significant risk factor for cancer. So getting vaccinated is great. So you can do it when you're like a pre-adolescent. It's like a two to three shot series, depending on where you're at and how old you are. And um, yeah, please, it's a vaccine for cancer, y'all get it. <laughs> All right, so what are some of the best methods for women and people with vaginas to use for birth control? Well, there's a lot of options. Um, it's one of those things that's um, kind of unfortunate that uh, gents and people with penises don't have as many options for birth control um, that they have control over. They're working on that. The FDA is um, recently approved or is in trial still a, a birth control medication for gents and people with penises. So that's awesome. But um, let's see, there's the mini pill. There's the standard birth control pill. There's barrier methods like male and female condoms. There's depo shots, which you get um, a shot in your ass every three months, basically. There's the um, rod inserts that you can put, um, get implanted into your arm. There's intrauterine devices. Um, there's hormonal ones and non-hormonal ones. The non-hormonal one is copper, I believe. And let's see, there's Nuva rings and diaphragms and spermicide and lots of different options. Unfortunately, most of the hormonal birth control options often have a lot of side effects, um, whether it's mood changes, libido changes, weight changes. Um, some people get really bad mental health concerns when they're taking hormonal birth control. Sometimes it works great and people don't have any concerns, but sometimes you have to try a few things and, you know, see what your doctor thinks is best for you, what your previous risk factors are, and try a few things until you find one that fits for you. All right. Um, now, this one is probably in its name, but um, when is the best time to take the morning after pill and uh, is there like a time limit that you have where it's no yeah. longer so effective? Yeah, uh, plan B or the morning after pill um, is a great way if you to, you know, try to prevent a pregnancy if you've had a condom break or if you made a kind of a stupid decision and didn't use a barrier method or a, a second birth control method um, and you had sex and got semen inside you. Um, it's for people with vaginas. Um, it won't do anything if a person with a penis takes it or a, a post-op trans woman either. Um, but it's a hormonal tablet that if you take it within the first 24 hours after the unprotected sex, it can be up to like 95% effective at pre preventing implantation of any fertilized blastocyst. If you take it within the first 72 hours, it's something like, oh, I have it written down here, 89, 89% um, good at preventing pregnancy, but that deteriorates quickly and it's not super reliable, um, better than nothing. So if, if that's where you're at, it's good to take because it does help, but it's not perfect. All right, so let's talk about abortion a little bit. Um, outside of the you know, probably most famous reason someone would get an abortion, which is just like unwanted pregnancy. What other reasons would there be for someone who has found themselves pregnant to procure themselves an abortion? Well, other than just, you know, finding yourself pregnant and not being in a place where you want to have children, uh, 
you could be pregnant with multiples and need to do a pregnancy reduction for the safety of yourself and for the other fetuses. There could be a condition of the fetus that is not compatible with life um, or that would result in a fetus born or a baby born who is just suffering or will live only for hours. And then you kind of have to make that sort of ethical, moral judgment call as to which is the most you know, the most moral choice, should we let this baby be born and suffer for a few hours or should we terminate in utero? Um, yeah, it's kind of a multifaceted issue. Yeah, obviously, we're not trying to make light of abortion. It is a really difficult decision for pretty much anyone who would need to go through it. So consult with your doctor, you know, if you need to see uh, someone who can provide mental health assistance with it, do that as well. This is by no means an easy topic to discuss. So should lesbians practice safe sex or does it not really matter? Everybody who has sex should practice safe sex. <laughs> For lesbians, it's uh, a little bit, not a ton different. You'll still want to use appropriate hygiene. You still want to use a barrier method. Um, like a dental dam for oral sex. Uh, it's a great barrier method if you want to do that. Um, hand hygiene, oral hygiene, pelvic hygiene is important for everybody regardless of your sexuality. The only difference with lesbians is if they're both cisgender lesbians you, or you know, post-op trans women, you don't run the risk of uh, impregnating anybody. So that's a good, that's a pro. Right. Uh, so could you describe the anatomy of the female reproductive organ from the outside in? <laughs> from the vulva in, you mean? <laughs> yes, because the whole Everyone apparatus to... is not actually called a vagina. Apparatus. No, that's one of those things that annoys me a little bit. It's not that big of a deal, but most people refer to the female genitalia as a vagina. And the external genitalia is called a vulva, collectively. There's the um, external uh, labia or the labia majora, internal uh, the labia minora, at kind of the top of the labia minora is the uh, point of the clitoris. The clitoris, clitoris is actually a partially external, partially internal structure. Um, the opening to the vagina is called the vestibule. The vagina is the tube, <laughs> the internal tube into which a penis is inserted or a toy or a baby comes out of. That's the vagina. The whole thing is not called a vagina. Um, at the end of the vagina is the cervix, which is kind of a spongy um, sort of opening that leads to the uterus. At rest, a uterus is like two inches by four inches, not very big. Obviously, it gets much bigger when the uh, person is pregnant. The fallopian tubes kind of extend from the top of the uterus and end in ovaries. Um, they're not actually connected to each other, There's like almost a little synapse there, but... Uh, and that's all connected to the pelvic wall with tendons and muscular tissue. And there it is. All right. So in your description of the female sex organ, you brought up the clitoris. Nature's Rubik's Cube. So could you tell us what its function is? And I don't know, maybe talk a little bit about how aware someone's Part, sexual partner should be of the clitoris? That really varies person to person. Uh, the clitoris's purpose um, in current evolutionary times is mostly for female reproductive uh, arousal and orgasm. Um, I kind of already described where it is. The point of it that you actually have external access to is kind of at the top of the labia minora. Um, it's covered by a little hood of tissue. The internal portion kind of extends down and around the rest of the pelvic pubic shape. Um, kind of like a wishbone. <laughs> it looks kind of like a wishbone, I always thought. Um, and, you know, it varies woman to woman how much attention you want to pay to it um, during sexual intercourse. Some people really like it paid a lot of attention to. Some people want Rougher pressure, slower pressure, softer pressure, up and down, side to side. Everybody's different. Communication is key. All right. So let's talk about uh, like oral and yeast infections. What are some good ways to prevent it and some good ways to treat it uh, 
should prevention methods not be successful. For people with vaginas, yeast infections are actually relatively common. It's a fungal infection. Uh, when you find it on other parts of the body, it's usually referred to as thrush um, or candida. Um, it's in the vagina, there's already, you know, fungal spores and bacteria that are kind of living in a healthy balance with one another. If the yeast, if the fungus overgrows, it causes an infection uh, that usually leads to kind of cottage cheese looking discharge. It's really itchy. It can be painful. It's very uncomfortable. Um, the easiest way to prevent it is, you know, first and foremost, hygiene, you know, stay clean. Don't stick anything up your snatch that doesn't belong up there. Don't douche. Don't put soap up there. Don't put any scented products up there. Scented tampons can disrupt the balance in there. Um, taking antibiotics sometimes will reduce your natural healthy bacteria and cause an overgrowth of fungus. Um, if you're diabetic and you keep your blood sugars too high, um, yeast and bacteria love sugar, so they will grow inappropriately, oftentimes if your blood sugars are out of whack. Maintaining a balanced diet, um, taking probiotics or eating plenty of yogurt can help. Um, if you've gone swimming, don't leave your wet clothing on for too long because a hot, wet environment is excellent for microbial growth. Um, and to treat it, it's actually really easy, usually. Usually you can go and buy an over-the-counter um, monostat, uh, just like an antifungal cream or little suppository that you just put up there. They're kind of annoying but it usually treats it within a few days. Sometimes people have to do a repeat treatment. That usually does it. If you've got a particularly stubborn one, you'll want to see your doctor. Okay, so you say you're not supposed to put something up in your vagina if it doesn't belong there, and I get that, but what if you're online one day and you come across the Goop website and you see one of those vaginal eggs that's made out of that uh, porous rock. Should you oh, put God. that up there? Please don't. Um, please don't. Anything porous will um, absorb all kinds of microbes that can be really hostile to your vaginal environment. Um, same is true of sex toys that are silicone-based. If you use a silicone-based or an oil-based lube, oftentimes it'll break down the toy such that it becomes porous. Um, so being careful with your um, sex toy products and using non-porous material up in your snatch. Um, if it's important to you to use, to, to do Kegel exercises or something like that, just use something that's not porous, like glass. They make all kinds of different products. Just please be careful. Don't stick plant life up there. Don't stick food up there. Don't stick oil products up there <laughs> for the most part. Just be gentle with your vag. All right, so let's talk about some misconceptions now. Okay. Um, the hymen, does it mm -hmm. always break or does it even actually have to break the first time a woman or someone who has a vagina has sex for the first time? I mean, if a person who has a hymen, not everybody has one, um, if a person who has a hymen has sex and their hymen wasn't already burst before by like, a tampon or jumping on a trampoline or riding a bike, which often happens, then it usually will uh, the first time you have sex, um, if it wasn't already, like I said, or if you have one. It's a very um, flimsy, usually just kind of um, a normal hymen, uh, normal, is kind of crescent shaped kind of at the base of your uh, vestibule. And it's just kind of a thin membranous tissue that will break easily. Like I said, riding a bike. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of blood associated with it. Sometimes there's not. Um, sometimes people have no hymen. Sometimes people have what's called an imperforate hymen that covers the entire opening of the vagina. That can lead to issues when your period starts because the blood can't get out. Um, there's also like micro perforate or septate hymens that are just shaped a little bit different and have different openings and they can cause problems and sometimes they totally don't. Everybody's different. And the whole concept of hymen presence for virginity is stupid. <laughs> All right. So um, kind of sticking into a similar vein, um, does the first time someone ha who has a vagina 
does the first time they have sex always is it always uncomfortable or painful no everybody's different sometimes especially if you're nervous um it can be uncomfortable or painful if you do still have a hymen present sometimes when that does tear it can be a little bit painful like i said sometimes there's blood involved um for a lot of people if especially if you're you know comfortable and ready and happy and excited and consenting it can be pretty comfortable but everybody's different if it does hurt for you for the first few times you're not weird that happens to a lot of people that's okay if um if it hurts or if it doesn't hurt it's nothing wrong with you it's just different everybody's different what does happen sometimes is some women or people with vaginas will get what's called vaginismus which is kind of an involuntary like muscle spasm in the pelvic floor um whenever you try to put something in the vagina. It could be a tampon, could be trying to have sex. Um, and that um, is very painful. And that does often prevent people who have this problem from having a healthy sex life um, if they want to. Um, oftentimes vaginismus is um, uh, mental or emotional um, from a previous trauma or from being not ready or nervous. Um, and sometimes that has nothing to do with it. And sometimes it just happens and we don't know why. We, you can see a doctor and get treatments for it. Sometimes that helps, sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of a complex problem. All right. And uh, the final misconception for this video, women don't have as much of a sex drive as men. So in that testosterone does drive um, sex drive quite a bit. Um, you could like loosely call that true. Um, everybody's sex drive is just different though. There are going to be plenty of women who have a higher sex drive than men. There are going to be plenty of just people who have varying sex drives, no matter what your gender is. Um, the presence of testosterone does tend to, to correlate with a higher sex drive. Uh, some trans gents, when they go on testosterone, will find that their sex drive increases. That's not universal, but it does happen. It's just depends. Everybody's different. All right. Well, uh, thanks for coming on and doing another sex ed. I'm looking forward to the next one. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. That'll do it for this one. If you have any questions you'd like to see answered in the next episode where we discuss female reproductive health, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below and we'll get to those, hopefully all of them, in the next Female Reproductive Health episode. If you enjoyed the video, please leave it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and click the notification bell to get notified whenever I upload a new video. And if you feel so inclined to help me out, consider giving me some money on Patreon. That sounds so heartless when I say it like that. Or get me something off my Amazon wish list. Every little bit helps in a big way, and every little bit of help is greatly appreciated. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, linked below, to keep up with all my comings and goings. And join me on Discord for a chance to talk to yours truly. Take it easy, everyone, and I will see you all in the next one.